So my name is Amanda Snyder. I am the president of our Spencer County Beekeepers Association. Not really sure how that happened, to be completely honest with you, but there we are. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my hair up because I can already tell I'm going to be walking around and hot. So I've been beekeeping for a couple years now. Um, Dave Hansberry is my go-to for everything bee, or Troy is my go-to for everything bee headache. Um, Troy gives me a hard time for quite literally everything. So we're going to talk about the biology of bees, and I'm going to do my best. If you think Trace is boring, whew, biology is something. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and get started. So the scientific classification of bees, Trey's already kind of covered a little bit about it, but we all know they're an insect. They have six legs. That's what identifies an insect. They are a part of um, the insect classification. They are, they are, their name is the Apis mellifera, which we already covered. So honeybees originated in about tropical Africa and then spread from South Africa to Northern Europe, west into India and China. They were brought to America with the first colonists and they are now distributed completely worldwide. There are bees worldwide. The first bees appear in fossil deposits about 40 million years ago. Trey kind of briefly touched on that one in his slide. You kind of saw the fossil of it. Um, about 30 million years before today is kind of when we start to see their social behavior and they're more structurally like the modern bees that we see now. So they've completely evolved and adapted to their surroundings quite like everything else. And now we're seeing that they're a very social um, insect as well as um, their structure has changed over time. So apis is the Greek word for swarm. And if you've been beekeeping for any amount of time, you know that's accurate. <laughs> they love to swarm. We, I don't even know how many swarms we picked up last year. For those that don't know what a swarm is, it's when the bees leave a hive and will collect on tree branches cars, trampolines, um, pretty much anywhere in just a ball of bees. And they're very calm. They haven't got really nothing to protect at that point. They're not protecting a home. They're kind of looking for their new home to be re relocated to. Um, so that's, we like those in the beekeeping world because those are free bees, which if you price bees, you know that they can be free pricely. So getting a free bee is the way to go. All right, we're gonna discuss the parts of a honeybee. And everyone thought I was crazy, but I don't feel like there's any better way to discuss the part of a honeybee than to give you a honeybee to look at. So I collected some dead honeybees from my bee yard and bagged them. Everybody's gonna get a little bee to look at while we're going along. <laughs> I know, crazy, right? <laughs> You know, I think that was a compliment, Dave. So some of you may be wondering why I have so many dead bees. It's winter, they die, they don't make it. Um, and then because it's so cold, they don't really take them out of the hive too, too far away. So they're easier to collect than say in the summer or spring. So some of them are really good. You can get their, you can see their wings and their tongue and, you can kind of see everything. But I figure a lot of us have never really been this close and personal with a bee. The extension office told me no to bringing in live bees. So here we go. You're welcome. I don't have a dead queen. If I had a dead queen, I'd have a whole other problem on my hands. You're welcome. I know you do. Yeah, Troy had to, so I told Troy I was bringing in dead bees. And so he had to, of course, one up me and bring in a whole hive. If you didn't feed them, you're welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. I walked right past you. Is you a dead bee? There. They're there in all their glory. Great idea. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. I didn't know how else to discuss the bees. <laughs> And if anybody wants an extra bee, I do have more. So, <laughs> well, they it, they will go bad in the bag. So, <laughs> I don't. Have, the, all the drones are dead right now. 
So in the fall, drones are kicked out of the hive because they don't really bring any benefit to the hive. So in the fall, when resources are scarce, out goes the drones. So these are all worker bees. There's no queens. Uh, you can take them out of the bag. They're not going to sting you if you want to, but that's, <laughs> I don't think I have any dead live bees. I think I grabbed them all. If you see, we, if you see some legs moving, let me know. But so we're going to discuss the entire honeybee in all of her glory. Um, and I am saying her because majority of the bees in a hive are females. We've already discussed a little bit about drones. We're going to get way more into drones here in a little bit. But these are all worker bees. These are all female bees. Um, like I said, bees do die I'm in the winter. It's not because I've done anything wrong. It's just nature and it's what happens. The reason again about why they're so easy to collect right now because they don't really take them too far out. Um, and there's so many, they just kind of dine them on the box to clean them out. We're gonna talk about how clean honeybees are too in a little bit as well. So let's get started with the most important part of the honeybee. So you've got one in front of you, take a look at her head. It's not that big, but it is the powerhouse of the honeybee. Very similar to you and I, it is where everything at. That's where her brain's at. That's where her eyes are. That's where her antennas are. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So this is where all of the, the powerhouse of the bee comes from. This is everything, every aspect of life outside of the body comes from this. Um, so again, like I said, the structures that are located here make everything possible for the bee to do anything. So you can look at it through their face and pretty interesting stuff. Did you know, or the more you know, Trey had did you know, I have the more you know. The honeybee's brain is about the size of a tiny grain of sugar. So think about that. You dump sugar out and you got this tiny little piece and that's how big their brain is. But research has been done to find out that they're actually very sophisticated creatures, which we all know this. I say it all the time. They're way smarter than us. And I 100% believe that. But they can be, they've been identified and researched enough to know that they can tell the same and different or above and below on objects. So not only will they know where the object's at, but they can also identify these physical features as well. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. So if you look at our bees in front of us, you will see their eyes. You'll see two eyes, but there's actually five all together. There's five eyes. So two are used for seeing. Those are the two big ones that you see. They're covered in hair. That's how they can, that's how they sense. But there's also three more eyes that are very small. They're on top of the head that you'll, they're a little bit harder to see, but those don't really have anything to do with Seeing per se, it's more along the lines of like their light sensors. And these are referred to as achelli. They have compound eyes, the two big eyes, and then the achelli eyes. So even though they're not necessarily, those achelli eyes are not necessarily used for seeing, they're very important in detecting light. So that way they know when it's time to wake up and go forage, when it's time to come back to the hive, it's getting dark, the weather, that kind of aspect. So again, way smarter than us. So like other bees, they cannot see the color red. I didn't know that, thought that was pretty interesting. But they can, however, sense UV light. Going back to the Zichelli eyes, that's what those are for, those UV lights. So you will see a honeybee visiting a red flower and collecting nectar, and that's all based off of the UV light that she sees. Pretty interesting. The other part on the head is the antenna. There's two of them. Some of them, you can see them really well on those bees that I passed out. Others are kind of curled in. Some of them have been dead for a little bit, so it kind of happens. But this is where their taste, their touch, their smell all comes from. So think of this as everything. Um, 
the antennas can act independently. So one can move to the left, one can move to the right. They do this to sense where their resources are at. So pretty interesting. <laughs> so this is especially important to the scout bees who their main source is to find in the food for the hive as well. So there's also another special structure located with the antenna, it's called the Johnston's organ. This structure is able to detect airflow. So this measures how fast they are flying and how far. Again, going back to you, they know how far to go, how far to come back to their hive. We also, if you've ever watched a live honeybee, you will see them clean their antennas with their legs before they take off. So we can understand how important this antenna is to their flight path and their flight pattern. The antennas are very, very sensitive and important for tasting things. There's over 300 taste sensors in those antennas. And you can see how small they are. It's pretty impressive. And let's discuss their tongue or the proboscis. So some of the bees, you will really see it. Some of them, I caught them with, they were, we caught them with their tongue out. Um, that sounds way worse than I meant for it to sound. But there, if you look on very closely, you can kind of see their straw-like tongue at the very tip of their mouth. So this is in the head, this is obviously in the head region. This is, there's three mouth parts that come together to kind of function like a straw that will suck up the water, the nectar for the plant, the plant and bring it back. So the length of their tongue will kind of determine how and what flowers they can um, collect nectar from. <coughs> so obviously if their proboscis is too short, certain flowers are completely off limits. Um, the longer, the more flowers they have to range. So pretty interesting. Moving on to the thorax. So below the head is the thorax. This is where all of the movement for the honeybee is comes from. So that's where their wings are. That's where their legs are. That's how they move. That's how they get around. Um, there's in all, there's three body parts of a honeybee and then what's involved in there goes on. So as you can see, there are three pairs of legs for a total of six. There are two pairs of wings for a total of four. But this is again, how they walk, how they fly, how they just move in general, all comes from this region of the honeybee. The wings. So again, they have four wings. They're on both sides or on each side of the thorax. They have um, these small hooks called hemuli that will enable the front and the back wings together. So it hooks them together so that way they can be in unison to fly with what makes them possible to fly. <laughs> in addition to flying, the wings also help the colony in a lot of other ways. It's how they control the temperature of the hive. That's how they can spread their pheromones, which we will get into, I promise. And I'm looking forward to that one. But um, going back to what Trey had mentioned earlier, the keeping the brood reach at a certain temperature is the most important part. And that's where these wings kind of come into play. So that's how they keep it cool when it needs to be kept cool and warm when it needs to be warm. thought this was pretty interesting. They can fly 15 miles an hour. So I don't know where your all's apiaries are, but mine's a four-wheeler right away. And I have absolutely made them mad enough that they have followed me on the four-wheeler. And it's pretty impressive because they're flying, what is that, 10, 15 miles an hour? And they're right there with me. But their wings can be 200 times per second or 12,000 beats per minute. I mean, you think about it, they're really tra traveling some ground with that one. And the legs, uh, all six of them. <laughs> so these, this cough is great. So the structure of the legs makes them very valuable for not only just moving around the hive, but also for grooming. Um, it's where they collect their pollen. We will often refer to them as pollen baskets. Um, this is how they clean their antennas. This is how they really clean the pollen off their bodies. 
Um, this is where they will carry back the pollen or the propolis, depending on where they're going. Um, and the fun fact, only the worker bees have pollen baskets. So you're not gonna find pollen baskets on a drone or a queen, it's only on the worker bee. So. So this is also kind of cool. So if you've ever opened a hive before and you've pulled out a frame and you'll pull it up, you'll see bees just kind of laddering together. They're kind of all hanging down. So that's actually them making their beeswax. And they use their legs. They will use all six of their legs to mold this and turn this into um, their honeycomb. And um, we call that drawing comb. So pretty interesting that their entire body really goes into taking care of this hive. So moving on, <laughs> we have our last segment of the bees, and this is the abdomen. So this is going to be below the thorax. It's going to be the longer part. Um, it's where the most popular, unpopular part of a bee is. That's their stinger. So this is located at but in addition to that, this is also where all of their internal organs are. So for their digestion, their respiratory, all of their organs are gonna be in this part of the bee. This is also where the reproductive organs are located. So ovaries for the queens and internal testes for the males. Their, their abdomens are covered with hair. Um, and then again, the stinger. So speaking of the stinger, let's talk about it. So Trey mentioned that whenever they sting, as you can see in this picture here, it pulls apart. And if you've ever been stung, especially if you've been stung in your gloves, you can really see that happen. Um, the reason for this is because their stinger is barbed. So once they sting, there is no retracting it. There is no pulling it out like some of the other bees. Um, But it's also, but their stinger is not just there for to hurt us, it's there to defend the hive from other predators as well. So obviously we all know that black bears are a huge predator when it comes to um, bees. We have, we have a, a black dog is a black bear in their eyes and I feel that's a black dog going near hives, but it happens. So it is, um, again, only the females have honey, have stingers. So drones again, they got a real good life. They don't really do much of anything. But <laughs> so only the female worker bees have stingers. The queen does have a stinger. Her stinger is different. So she actually can retract her stinger. And the reason she has a stinger is to kill off other queens. So in the event that there's more queens being made, queen cells inside the hive, she can actually sting it, kill that queen off because only one queen per hive. But whenever they sting you, again, because they're barbed, it will pull out their poison sac and it will stay into you. And that's also used as a defense mechanism as well because then it continues to keep pumping poison, their bee poison into you for about 10 seconds. So that's why it's the most important part to scrape, make sure you're getting that bee venom out as well. Does anyone have any questions on the part of the bee? The bringing in a bee and work, did that help? <laughs> you know, you're not gonna really get a chance to be this up close and personal with a bee. I mean, you will, but you won't want to be. <laughs> That's usually not one of the happiest. Yeah. No. Oh, sorry. So there, there the question was, Thanks for reminding me. So the question was asked was if they lose a wing, is there any part of the body that can be, that can grow back? And the answer to that question is no. Once they lose it, it is gone. And you will see, especially when you, there's robbing going on, which I don't know how familiar we are with robbing, but that's when another hive tries to take the resources of another hive. Um, you'll see them kind of fighting outside the hive and they will rip wings and legs off of their, the bees trying to take over the new, trying to take over that hive. It's a, Pretty brutal, in all honesty, to watch. Um, but no, if you'll see some bees walking around with five legs, I've seen it. Um, doesn't really seem to affect them that much, but they're obviously not gonna be as strong. So I didn't have a way to bring in eggs and larvae, 
but if I could have figured out a way to do it, I probably would have. So we're going to talk about the life cycle of the honeybee from egg to adult bee. Um, I liked this picture a lot because it really shows each stage that they go through um, until they reach the adult bee stage. <laughs> so stage one is the egg. So the queen bee is the only one in the colony who's capable of laying about 2,000 to 3,000 eggs a day. I'm going to follow that up with a caveat. Workers can lay eggs. They can only lay drone eggs. Um, and they only typically do that in the event of they're queenless or not queen right. Um, we don't want that if as a beekeeper, if you see a worker laying eggs in a cell, not a good sign. I mean, there's, there's some kind of issue. The reason, and a lot of people will turn and I can see it. The reason you can tell the difference between a queen laying and a worker laying is there will be one egg, which is the queen, usually in the center of the cup, usually with workers will be multiple. The most important thing to know is that queens lay the eggs, queens make the babies. The egg is positioned upright, so when she lays it, it will be completely upright, like you can see in these pictures, and then it'll fall to the side by day three. She will lay both fertilized and unfertilized eggs. So the unfertilized eggs, again, being the drones, fertilized eggs being the females. Um, the unfertilized eggs will hatch and the drones are born. That's kind of it. So interesting fact about drones that I don't think I put it in here and maybe I did, I can't remember. So technically speaking, a drone has no father. The queen is both the mother and the father of a drone that's laid by an unfertilized egg. So pretty interesting little tidbit of information. Stage two is the larva stage. So this is where the difference between a worker and the queen bee is going to be made. So in the event that they are, do not have a queen, the hive, the worker bees can decide to make their own queen. Um, how they do this is they select the egg that they want to make and they will feed it royal jelly throughout the entire gestational period or life cycle period, however you want to word that one. All of the larva is fed royal jelly. All larva are fed royal jelly for the first three days. The queen will While queens continue that. receiving royal jelly, worker <laughs> bees and drones receive different feed thereafter. So the question was asked, how long will a hive last without a queen? So I'm going to answer that question first with math. So about 3,000 bees die a day. Queen lays about 3,000 eggs a day. So there's about, I mean, 50, 10,000 bees in a hive, 50,000 bees in a hive, depending on the size of their hive. So they will, they will make it for a little bit but not very long. It's very important that we get some queen right as soon as possible. As soon as you notice that there's nothing being laid, it's very important to go ahead and get that process started. Um, just simply for the fact that they're losing that many and there's nothing coming in to replace them. And we'll get into it a little bit too. The worker bees have different jobs throughout their life cycle. Um, so once they hit that certain age, their job is to move on and kind of do the next part of their, their, their task. Um, so, that might mean that there's more foraging, less in the hives, so you're going to lose more bees that way. It's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint the math exactly because a standard work would be last that's about what like six weeks in the midsummer, right? It takes 21 days for them to actually hatch. So if the queen's laying, all of them, she dies off, gets that 21 days to lay hatch, then you just kind of have a couple of months before. And by the time that so then you also got to think too, by the time that they make a queen, they've decided they want to make this egg a queen. She's got, she's got a gestational period of 16 days and then she has to go on mating flights before she can start laying. That's another two weeks. So it's very important to get this turned over very quickly because like you said, they do only live about six to eight weeks in the summer. Um, so it's important to kind of keep it moving, to keep the hive right. And you can tell that they're not hot. You can tell when they're not queen right too because I've found that they're more aggressive um, and we're going to get into pheromones and I'm going to explain all of that in a little bit, but it's pretty interesting. It's just, it's very important to get a change as soon as you notice it to get a queen in there, get, get one either made, get them in the process of making one or to buy a queen that's already made it to throw in the box. Um, it's queens are in the, queens are the powerhouse of the hive. Without her, they will not survive. 
So finally, the worker bees will cover the top of the cell with beeswax to protect it from any debris from in, coming into the hive. Um, and then this will help them transform into a pupa. So the pupal stage, you'll see here, this is where they start to look like bees. This is where they get their wings, their eyes, um, they start to get some body hair, their legs. So I love this picture because unless you've actually ever uncapped a cell and saw this, you wouldn't probably believe it. They are creepy looking things. No way else to put it. They are creepy. People will call this the purple eye stage um, for obvious reasons, their eyes are purple. Um, they're starting to look more like an adult bee. And then finally, stage four, they are, they chew their way out of their cell and will begin their adult life. Um, so again, it takes 16 days for a queen from egg to adult, takes anywhere from 18 to 22 days for a worker. And of course those drones take the longest at 24 days. So another fun fact about drones. I love those little guys, they're fun. I like them because they don't sing, honestly. And they're just little chubby things, I just love them. But <laughs> they, um, I'm not gonna use the word lazy, but it's, that's what it is. They will not chew themselves out of their cell. So they actually have to be chewed out by a worker. Um, they are, they've got the life, I'm telling you. So once they are born, once they come out of this stage, this is when they begin their lifestyle. So this is when all of their worker bee tasks will begin. Um, this is when the queen goes, on, she'll be coming out, she'll be going on her flight, become a mated queen. Um, this is kind of the beginning of the hive. So let's discuss the worker bees and their tasks. Does anyone have any questions about the life cycle before I move on? Yes. Yeah, so the question was asked, well, if the queen dies and they have, we introduce a new queen and the queen is not accepted, what happens? They will kill her. The workers will kill her. That's, there's no other way to put it. I can't put it any more lightly than that. Um, so there are, there are ways to introduce a queen. If you're, so if they're not making their own queen, we're buying a queen from somebody else and putting that queen in there. There are ways to slowly introduce her into the hive so they kind of get used to her pheromones um, and kind of accept her as the new queen. Um, sometimes you can do, I had a hive last year that I did everything right. They, the moment I put her cage near the hive, they started attacking that. They did not want that queen in there. I, um, I did everything I could, kept her in the cage a little bit longer than I would have really liked to kept her in the cage and they still killed her. So sometimes they just won't accept her. It just is what it is. Yes. So what they do, so the question was asked, well, how do they, how will they, can she handle it? Can she survive them trying to kill her? So what they when do worker bees decide, decide to dispatch a queen bee, bee. they will surround the queen bee, bee and form a ball bees. around her. They'll this ball behavior is called her. balling. Make her During really this, the bees hot. generate a large amount of heat really really hot, so that causes the queen to overheat and die. Kind of like an explosion. So they're not actually stinging her per se, they're more on the lines of just kind of balling up around her and trying to get rid of her that way. We've seen it happen before where you can actually dig to the bottom of the ball and find the queen. Um, and in that case, put her in another hive, see if she's accepted better there, things of that nature. But typically she won't survive if you don't catch it. So even her stinger, she won't sting them. She really only uses her stinger to sting other queens. So the, the question was asked, do they know what their job is? Like, do the worker bees know what their job is day one? Yes, they know day one what they need to be doing and they will do it. They, there's a, the reason why they're called worker bees is because they work and they know what their job is day one. And we're gonna get into that just in a little bit of kind of, <laughs> depending on their days, what it looks like. So 
there so the worker bees make up 80 percent of the hive in the summer because there are some drones in there at this point come fall it's 99.9 <laughs> you might find a lucky drone that didn't get kicked out but that's far and few between um but so day one when they are born their job is to start cleaning the hive so what they're going to do is they're going to clean the hive get it ready for the queen to lay the next set of eggs into so that's their job cleaning the hive making sure everything's ready for her because I can't say it enough, they're very hygienic creatures. I mean, they don't like mess. Um, like Trey was talking about with the propolis, they will encase their predators with that to keep them from infecting the hive or decomposing near the hive, which is really crazy. So by day three to day 12, they are serving the queen and helping rear the young. So they're feeding the young bees their um, royal jelly, making sure that they're ready to go coming into their life. By day 12 to day 20, they're actually building the comb. So again, going back to using all six of those legs to build each cell, that's their job. And they know all of this. They're not told. Well, they are told, but we'll get into pheromones in a little bit. So then by day 20 to day 43, that's kind of when they start guarding the hive, going out and collecting nectar and pollen until they ultimately meet their demise. Um, but yeah. So she asked what happens to drones when they get kicked out. Well, honey, they die. <laughs> I'm talking a lot about death, and I'm really sorry, but that's what happens. They don't have any resources. They can't survive. Um, and we're going to get into drones and just how lazy they are in a couple of slides because they really, they really don't have much of a benefit to the, the hive. They have some, but not a whole lot. So they have to, you just got to think. So they've only got a certain amount of food to get into winter, right? And if you have only the bees coming in, bringing in the food, they're just kind of stealing it. Right, so when, with, when resources get limited, they've got to kick somebody out. So if they're not really bringing any benefit to the hive, they're gonna have to, to go. Yes, honey. So she asked how they know if they're a drone bee or a worker bee, and then if, since the drone has to be chewed out, do they just know to do that? So they release pheromones when they're inside in this pupa stage, and that kind of releases a pheromone to the rest of the hive to kind of let them know where they're at in that stage, if it's time for them to come out. So it's all going to be related back to pheromones. Um, that's how they know it's time to be chewed out. That's how they know it's time to make that drone come out of his cage as well. So drones are an unfertilized egg. So they're, gonna, they're in a bigger cup. Um, so they, kind, they already know that going into it. They, they, they're way smarter than us. <laughs> so they know that going into it. They're not told uh, other than about the pheromones. So it's time for them to come out. Do you wanna have any, else, any other questions? Yes. So then again, <laughs> When they become the nurse bees, so we, we can call them nurse bees, we'll call them worker bees, we'll call them guard bees. They have lots of different names depending on the task at hand. So the bees that you see out flying around, collecting pollen, collecting nectar, those are your worker bees. Um, when you pull a frame up and you see bees kind of tending to the brood, that is your nurse bees. They don't, they're not as, um, they're a little bit easier to get along with <laughs> than say the worker bees. And then um, once they go out foraging, that's their job. So again, in the summer, they work about, they live about six to eight weeks just because of the, they're working, they're, they're, they're constantly moving, but then they also have more predators. So birds, other insects, cars, um, people's feet, things of that nature. So they're, they're out more, so that's why their life stands shorter and they're also working harder. In the winter, they're kind of staying more close into the hive. They're not really out foraging because there's nothing to forage on. Um, so that way they live, they can live about six months come winter time because of that. The queen. Again, she is the center of the universe. Without her, there is no hive. So her scent, her pheromone is spread throughout the hive to make sure that all the bees know that all is well in the hive. Um, so if something, she's not happy about something, she releases a pheromone, they know this. Um, if 
they, that's just, that's how they know who she is and that's where she's at. So again, she lays about 3,000 eggs a day. Fun fact, 3,000 eggs weigh about three times her body weight. So she lays three times her body weight in eggs. Pretty crazy. If there is no laying queen, they will create one. Um, and if one cannot be created, it is us as beekeepers job to make sure that a queen is introduced into that hive to keep it running smoothly. Does anyone have any questions about the queen? So queens can live about two to three years because um, they're obviously not out foraging and buzzing around. They're more, they're um, taken care of inside the hive. So you're, you're probably never going to see a queen flying unless you catch her going on a mating flight um, or you catch them swarming, but you won't ever see her out and about. And I've never heard of anyone getting stung by a queen bee either, so I think we're safe. But as you can tell by the picture, she is significantly larger than the worker bees as well. All right, everyone's favorite topic so far, the drones. <laughs> so again, he has one job. His job is to mate the queen. Um, he doesn't forge, he doesn't clean the hive, he doesn't take care of the young. Um, doesn't really do any of that. In all honesty, he doesn't even like to feed himself. He actually prefers to be fed. So he's got the best life, I think. Um, he has half the genetic material of a queen simply because he is created from an unfertilized egg. So again, going back to the queen is his mother and his father. So they do not collect nectar or pollen. They can barely feed themselves. Um, but they do have some unappreciated role. So their drone brood is significantly larger and it's going to be around the worker brood and that is where the event that there is an attack on the hive that's where they would go first right so kind of work their way in so that's what they're there for they're basically sacrificial lambs they're taking one for the team um their brood also acts as a filter removing pests uh, before they can infest the other broods so when i briefly touch on varroa mites later on we'll kind of discuss that they can lay I think a varroa mite can lay like up to three or four um, mites in a drone brood cell, whereas in a worker, it's like two. So they're significantly larger. Does anyone have any questions about drones? We've had lots of questions about drones. I want to make sure that I'm not going past them. We're going to get into their, their makeup in a little bit, but <laughs> yes, honey. You know, that's, I, I, has anyone ever been stung by a queen bee in here? I can't answer this one from experience. I don't think they sting humans, but I know that it kills other queens. So I would assume it's probably pretty fatal, pretty hurts, pretty bad, but I have no idea to know for sure. I don't Amanda, know. this is Jake chiming in your ear. Uh, the yes. queen can sting, but she doesn't have a barbed stinger, but it's exceptionally rare for her to sting. Uh, like queen rears, they'll get stung maybe once every two or three months. Okay, so Jake chimed in. He said that um, it's extremely rare for the queen to sting, but she can sting and queen rears will um, occasionally get stung once or twice a month um, when they're handling the queen. Do you know if it hurts, Jake? That was the question. Oh yeah, it's the same, uh, same poisons come out. The, the stinger is not barbed, uh, so she doesn't lose her stinger with the act of stinging, uh, okay. but it is still the same. Uh... Okay, so Jake said that the sting feels the exact same as a worker sting, but she doesn't lose her stinger, so therefore she can, she lives. So that's the only difference. It's not a barb stinger. Any more questions about drones or queens or worker bees? Yep. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the drone and what he does. So his job again is to mate the queen. So I did mention this earlier when I was talking about the eyes of a bee, but think about this. So drones, Drones and queens mate in the air. So they are flying when they mate. What will happen is a queen will visit a drone congregation. Um, they will spot her, the drone will spot her. And then from there, whoever's the fastest and can mount her first 
get the first go. So he will insert his endophallus into her, releasing semen, ejaculating semen. After ejaculation, he will pull away from the queen, but his endophallus is ripped from him, left in the now the made it queen, and then will he will succumb to his injuries. So his job is to mate, and that is it. This is everyone's favorite topic, my least favorite to talk about. <laughs> so again, going back to their eyes, though, you got to think about this. So a, a, a mated queen will be smaller than, or a virgin queen will be smaller than a mated queen. She's still bigger than a worker bee, but she's smaller. To see her flying in their direction to go after her to mate, it's pretty impressive. Their eyes are significantly better than, say, a worker's or a queen's for that reason alone, to make sure they spot her. So yeah, that's, that's his job. A queen will mate with up to, I believe it's 15 or 20 drones in a two week time frame. Um, she has a spermethica that she will hold sperm um, that will be what she will lay her eggs with throughout her entire life. Once the sperm runs out, she can't lay any longer, the hive will replace her. And this is again all going back to pheromones. Does anyone have any questions on the mating process? No? <laughs> yeah, good. Good. <laughs> uh, it's always a fun topic. So, if you think that was boring, we're going to get into pheromones. And whoo, they are some words in here that will make your eyes go sideways. But this is the most important part of a hive, the most important part of their biology. This is how they know what they're supposed to be doing, when they're supposed to be doing it, and how they're supposed to be doing it. Um, so bees will communicate in about in three primary methods. The first is touch. So you will see the bees come in and kind of touch each other when they've been out foraging. Um, they're, what they're doing is they're getting a whiff of them to make sure that it's their bee that's coming back home. It's their sister coming back home and not someone else out and about. Also, they're finding out if there are, you know, there's, there's um, other sources or where they've been and they found good pollen or nectar or whatever. They will also measure their feet to kind of figure out the size of the comb cell too, which I thought was pretty important, was pretty um, interesting. And then again, touch is very important. So they'll, they'll clean each other. They will keep their antennas clean. Going back to you, they're extremely hygienic. Um, they want to make sure that everything is staying clean and this is how they do that. Secondly, they use the pheromones. So this is going to be their unique scent. So every single hive has her, their own unique scent. So every colony is going to have their own unique scent. And this is how the bees can tell where they live, um, everything from the hive. And that pheromone is created from the queen. <laughs> this also, the, the queen produces her own pheromone, which will inhibit the females from laying eggs as well. So it actually, we're gonna talk about it in a little bit, but it will actually inhibit her from growing ovaries. Um, so she cannot produce to lay eggs. So they, that's how they know. It also keeps them calm. They know that, I always say, I always joke, I'm like, mama's in the box. They're happy, they're calm, they're, they're quiet. Um, and that's kind of, that pheromone is what tells them that. Lastly, and probably the most unique method of communication, we refer to it as the waggle dance. Um, so it's exactly what it sounds like. They will get on a, it, they'll get on a, an area and they will dance. Um, this is how they vote. So they kind of operate in a democracy. It has to be a unanimous decision before they will leave their hive to swarm or to find a new location to live. Um, they will do this dance. And then the more they get involved with doing this dance will be how they make their decisions going forward. So it's pretty interesting. Um, they will also do this dance if they've, um, you know, they've, they, 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 tongue -tied. they will uh, use this to kind of talk about the resources that they found as well. So they'll kind of stand and waggle um, to kind of bring their sisters over to where they're at. Do we have any questions about the three communication methods? No? Okay. <laughs> so 
So the alarm pheromone. So there are two types of the, or two types of alarm signals. So one is going to come from the jaw of the honeybee, and this is going to um, basically paralyze other intruders to help them get kicked out of the hive. So then when this pheromone is released, other bees know that they're under attack and it's all hands on deck, but this one comes from the jaw. Um, the other one, the second alarm, it comes from a gland that's in their abdomen. It has over 40 different chemicals. And this chemical is released when the stinger of the bee is exposed. So this is the one that will trigger an attack on say you and I. Um, some will say that it smells like bananas. I've never personally smelled it. Trey has smelled it and took off running. Um, <laughs> so once you smell this banana smell, that's kind of a good idea that you're, you're about to be under attack. Um, they, again, it's all being released off of pheromones. <laughs> so when you wear your gloves, which Troy's gonna talk about your beekeeping equipment in a little bit, but you have gloves that you wear, um, but typically made of goat skin, I do believe. Um, they will sting those gloves. So obviously your hands, think about it, your hands are in the hive more, right? So they will sting your glove numerous times. But when they do this, the pheromones release and will stick into your gloves. So that can also trigger them to attack your gloves more. So it's really important to make sure that you're keeping your gloves, especially your gloves clean, um, you can smoke them. The smoke has shown to help kill that pheromone off a little bit. Um, but usually when you get to the point that they're ready to attack, there's really no turning back. Does anyone have any questions about the alarm pheromones? Yes. So bee poison is their poison sac released for their stinger. So this is not the same thing. Yeah. Any more questions? The queen pheromone, so this is a very complex cocktail of chemicals. There's been tons of research done um, over these chemicals, and I'm just gonna stand right here and read this one because there's no better way to do so than to this one. So there are two pheromone groups, the QMP and the QRP. Um, the QMP was originally thought to be the only set of chemicals in a queen's pheromones, but up until I believe the start of the century, they kind of identify that it's actually the QRP. There are four main chemicals, the non-ODA, the non-HDA, the HOB, and HVA. Do not ask me what those mean. I do not know. Um, <laughs> but there's been a lot of research done on the ODA and the HDA just simply for the amount that's in this. Um, this is coming from that jaw, again, that jaw pheromone that we talked about earlier. Um, this one will, this ODA, will kind of depress the ovarian development in worker bees. So kind of going back to that. So this, they've identified the ODA was what is the suppressant to the other worker bees developing ovaries and being unable to lay. The HDA has a stabilizing factor. So it's a tranquility. So when I said earlier, you know, a lot of, if, you're, if your hive is clean, right, you can typically tell by how calm they are. They're easier to handle. Um, when you pop the lid, they're not, coming out at you. Um, it's usually, I mean, they still will, even if they are queen, right? Depending on situations, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. But they are, um, you can always tell, usually. I mean, if you can get into a hive and pull frames and you're not being completely attacked and covered up immediately, they're usually, that, that tranquility from the pheromone is in there. Now, the QRP has more of an acid-based chemical, alcohol, um, chemicals that are into this one. So these new chemicals are still being completely studied. They're still trying to figure out um, how they're produced and where they're produced. But it's pretty interesting because again, going back, they originally only thought that it was those first four and they've now identified four additional um, in the queen pheromone. So I was asked earlier, how do they know what to do when they know how to do it? Well, this is it. The foraging, form, the foraging pheromone, this is a pheromone that will be transferred mouth to mouth from the bees. This is when they will know that it is time to go out and produce and go out and forage and collect resources for the hive. This is again, all done through pheromones. 
um, when this pheromone is not as available in the hive as it should be, they will know this and know that it's time to go out and produce. So the Nesno pheromone. So this is on the back side of their abdomen. Um, this gland is what produces um, the, the scent of each hive. So you will see sometimes, and in this picture, this picture is a great example. You will see them staying at the entrance of their hive with their abdomen in the air and beating their wings. And they're, what they're doing is they're spreading that, that scent out into the bee yard or their, wherever they're at. And they do this to help new bees that are going on orientation flights to know to come back to this particular hive. They also do it when the queen goes out on her mating flight to make sure that she knows what hive to come back to. Um, you'll typically see this with lots of bees doing it at the same time. It's not typically just one. Um, it's pretty interesting, again, to watch them do this. But what they're doing is they're, they're exposing that gland and then taking their wings and fanning it out to spread that scent. So that way they know. I think I pretty much covered all that one, but <laughs> they will also, this, oh, this is the other one I forgot to mention. So they will also do this too. They use this pheromone when they find water because water has no scent, right? So how else are they gonna say, hey, come on over, there's water over here because there's no scent there. So I always joke before I, so I'll kind of give a little bit of history. Trey and I are neighbors. Um, before I knew that he had bees, I have a pool. And I had no idea that he had bees. Didn't even know who he was, honestly. And uh, I was in my pool, when I was in my pool, and all of my floats were covered with bees. I mean, hundreds of bees were in my pool drinking this water. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do. And so at the time, I really didn't understand the importance of honeybees. I knew that they were important, but wasn't where I'm at now, <laughs> where I'm talking about honeybees and teaching a class about honeybees. So I called a friend and I said, okay, I've got all these bees. I don't know what to do with them. How do I get rid of them? Like, I don't want to kill them because I know they're important, but I want to use my pool too. Um, so she goes, oh my gosh, you have a feral hive somewhere. That's awesome. Like, you need to call a local beekeeper and like have them come find this feral hive and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, this seems like a lot of work. Um, I'm not really interested in that. She's like, well, they won't bother you. Well, she was right, but they still buzzed around you and buzzing gets scary. I mean, if you've never been around bees, the buzzing can be pretty intimidating. I even call it phantom buzzing. If we've been in the hives all day, I start, I can, I'll go lay down at night and I can hear them buzzing in my ear. I know Dave has a observation hive in his bedroom um, so apparently he falls asleep to buzzing bees. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so the reason there were so many bees in this pool was that they were releasing this pheromone saying, hey, we found water, a good water source, come and join us. Um, long story short, I ended up finding out that they were his bees and I said I should get free honey because I did take care of their water. And then I made a joke too because it was really light honey. I was like, it's all the chlorine. So again, this is kind of going back to that voting that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm not going to really talk about it. I'll actually going to take this one out of here, but I did not. So another question that was asked earlier, how do they know when it's time to release the, the drones, more specifically, or when it's time to come out? And this is done by the brood pheromone. So this is actually a pheromone that's produced by the larvae inside their cell. So when they're in that stage of the development process, um, and this is to suppress the stimulation for ovary growth in the worker bees. So again, going back to, they know that they're worker bees, they know that they're not supposed to be laying, um, goes into that. But this is also exposing, it's also being released to the nursing bees to know that it's time to come and take care of this brood. So it's time for this bee to go on to the next stage. It also will let the, the hive know how well the queen's doing as well. So if she's laying very well, this pheromone will be stronger. Um, the queen, they'll know that she's doing her job and she's still got a little bit of lifeblood. <laughs> this is also the pheromone that lets the bees know the difference between the worker and the drone. So that's how they know based off of this pheromone. Does that answer your questions a little bit about how they know everything? It's just all pheromones. Um, I accidentally hit this button, so I'm thinking that was me. Okay. 
that was me. I hit a button. So, you know, look at me messing things up again. Um, does anyone have any questions about pheromones? Yes. Yes. I have hives in my backyard and I've never had them in that pool again since. Is that because there's a water source closer to your So there's the same water sources. We've actually got a neighbor that has a farm just across the road. And you know, when it gets into the hot summer months and the hot the next door stuff dies down, bees are really looking for a water source more than ever, right? They got to cool the hive and they you drink it. Anywhere they can find water, they're going to find it. Whether it's some like koi pond or a pond or a lake or a creek, I mean, whatever the case may be. Whatever. They prefer fresh water over the chlorine. Yeah. They do. I mean, you'll still, I mean, I will still, I, I can't say that I don't ever have bees in my pool because I do. But I mean, I won't have, I haven't had, this was a few years ago, that I had this, like, this I mean, my pool was a black pool of bees. Um, I did learn something from that experience. So those mesh floats, they can get on and land. So they really like those. So don't put those in your pool. You're probably not going to have a snake. Now you will occasionally, like splashing around on the sides, they'll come up and drink that. Um, there's actually a picture of me somewhere and I'm in the pool and I have a bee crawling up my arm that I was helping because she was drowning. So I was helping her out. Um, and she's crawling up my arm, but they're very, I mean, I've, I've taught the neighbor kids to like come over and how to scoop them out of the water. I mean, they're not aggressive by any means. Um, and again, a bee's job is not to sting you. They don't want to sting you unless they really, really have to. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I've learned that if you don't keep those mesh floats in there, they won't really land on it. They, you're still going to have them around. I mean, but again, I have hives in my backyard um, and I don't really have any more issues. Well, I have them everywhere. Let me rephrase. I have them everywhere. <laughs> so I've got a, a bigger yard that has, oh geez, about 15 hives and I have two behind my house. Um, so they're, they're kind of all spread over, but my two by my house, like, so you'll learn something about me. I'm kind of kooky. Um, when it comes to bees, like they're my babies. I love them to death, but, um, I nickname all my, my hives and the two by my house are my tattletale hives because I swear they knock on the window when there's something going on. People think I'm crazy. He thinks I'm crazy. I just swear it happens. Um, they'll come and tell me like I, they will, they'll leave me alone pretty much for the most part. And then when they start coming around me, I'm like, okay, what's going on? Um, but like, so another thing that's really big food source for them as well is the hummingbird feeders. Just think about that. That's sugar water, right? That's what we feed them. Um, but again, I have hummingbird feeders. I don't ever have them on there. Um, but I had a call last year where a woman had, she had the perfect habitat for a honeybee. She had flowers everywhere and had multiple um, hummingbird feeders and she had a pool with the mesh floats in it and there were bees everywhere. I'm like, you're giving them their best life right now. They don't have to go anywhere. They've got everything they need right here um what i told her to do and it worked i said take your hummingbird feeders down for a couple of days they'll, they'll find something else they'll move on and then you should be good and she was but again i don't ever have any issue in my house with them yep we've even put out a We've um we put out a kitty pool with some we cut some pool noodles in half, filled it with water, and they'll land on that too, and drink from that. <laughs> I feel like just speaking from experience there, Dave. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions about pheromones? So the question was asked, do my hives attack each other to get resources? And the answer is, I would like to say no, but yes, they, I'm sure they do. Um, like anything else, they're bees. I mean, they're, 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 their job is to survive is just as like it's Store and I's job to survive. Um, how they do it's a little whatever, but. Correct, yes. So each hive, I mean, they can be lined up just like they're on the table right now, and each one of them will have their own scent. Um, but yes, I mean, they do, it's called robbing. 
it does happen, especially during the dearth. Um, that's when there's no nectar or pollen flow coming in. Typically, it can be the beekeeper's fault. Um, you know, let's say we're feeding them sugar water and I drop just a tad bit of sugar water, those other bees are gonna sense it and come straight to it. Um, so it's really, you gotta be really, really careful when you're, especially during the dearth, when you're feeding them. Yeah, so Trey mentioned a good point. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff that you'll research, you know, they'll talk about essential oils to attract the bees to it. Um, in my experience, I've found that that causes a lot of problems because that oil is so strong, it will attract everything around it to it. Um, then Troy's going to get into feeders and all of that. So I'll leave that up to Troy and we'll kind of show you the different kinds of feeders and kind of what works best for all of us. Um, but it's, I mean, it's all scent. They, everything that they do is revolved around scent, whether it be their own, whether it be a food source, no matter what, it's all revolving around scent. Any more questions about pheromones before we move on? Nope. <laughs> so let's talk about honeybee breeds. I could stand up here for nine hours and talk about all the breeds and all the hybrids in the world, but I'm not gonna do that because it's boring. Um, but I am gonna talk about these six. And the reason why I picked these six is because they're the most um, widely known honey bee breeds in the area. Um, I, I could be completely wrong when I say this, but I find that to find a true breed of a honey bee is gonna be almost impossible because let's say I have Carnolians and I have Italians and well, they're both making drones and the drone mates with the queen, right? So if my Italian queen goes off, my Carnolian drones are going to follow her, right? Um, so in my opinion, I don't know if there's a true breed anymore. I could be wrong. You all are feel free to correct me or tell me I'm wrong. I'm totally fine with it, whatever. Um, but I put this up here. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in depth, but I'd like to this slide because it kind of showed you, you know, are they gentle? Um, how do they do over winter? How do they do in the spring? Do they produce more honey or are they more pollinators? Um, kind of that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about each one of them individually though, going right now. So Italian bees, <laughs> excuse me, are the most widely used race honeybee stock. They originated in Italy, imagine that. They were brought to the United States in 1859 and they quickly replaced the German bee that was brought over by the first colonists. They are known for their prolific brood cycles and production. They're very gentle. Um, they're good honey producers and they are reluctant to swarm. And I say reluctant to swarm because all bees will swarm if they run out of space. So, so, so that caveat in there. Now, whether or not they're more likely is a different story. Um, they are very strong foragers and do a great job of keeping the hop clean. A lot of commercial beekeepers will use Italians for their honey production. Um, they're very light colored. They're almost yellow in some colonies. They're pretty easy to take to tell apart and to identify. But there are some drawbacks. So because of their prolific brood, they do consume resources at a much higher rate um, and that can last deep into the fall. Because, so let me kind of break that out. So they will lay into the fall. The queen will lay into the fall. Um, and so when she's laying brood, they obviously have to have resources to take care of the brood and themselves. So they will go through it faster. So whereas other bees will kind of slow down come fall, she keeps on going. Um, they are also notorious for robbing. So they're your, they're the, your bees that like to drift to a new hive and kind of uh, take over. The reason why we don't want this is because it's how disease is spread. Um, well, it's one of the many ways that diseases are spread, but it's one of, it's kind of that. Um, they also have to, they also tend to have be a little bit more difficult with natural pests and tend to have higher collapse rates because of this. Um, there's really no, re there's research being done to kind of figure this out why this is the case, but um, yeah. But if you're new to beekeeping, they're a great option. So if you wanna produce honey, you want some gentle bees, this is the one that I'd recommend. Does anyone have any questions on Italian bees? No? Carnolian are the second most popular bee stock in the United States, second to the Italian. They are darker and have brown spots or bands around their abdomen. They're slightly smaller 
than others. So if you're sitting next to your partner, compare your bees, and you might be able to find a carnelian and an Italian, because I've pulled from all of them I have. Um, so depending on size, it's a good way to tell. This, um, this, one's, this one's really favored for a lot of reasons. And um, the reasons are because they have an explosive spring buildup. So when, it, when nectar starts flowing, pollen starts coming, they build up their hop quick. That can also be a downside, so if they build up too quickly, they will swarm. So you gotta keep on top of them. Um, because of their origin, they're better during the cold. So they'll actually tend to get out on cold, wet days and forage, whereas other bees will pretty much avoid that area. They're also pretty good at fending off parasites and have some resistance to some diseases, which is pretty good. And another interesting thing, they have one of the longest tongues of any of the bee stocks. So they're really used for pollination. Um, so they, in the winter, they tend to stay in the tight cluster of bees and will feed off of modest food supplies. So they don't really require a whole lot of food um, to survive compared to other bees. But overall, this is a great option for new beekeepers who are wanting an easy handling, gentle um, bee. They're not as big of a honey producer as say the Italians, but they do produce. Any Carnolian questions? So the mutt of the bee world is the buckfist. This bee, this was brought around um, in the United Kingdom. They are, there was, in the United Kingdom in the 20th century, there was a lot of collapse happening due to mites and things of that nature. So their head beekeeper, which I'm just gonna call him Carl, cause I'm not gonna try to pronounce his last name, Carl, bred two bees together to kind of create this, this breed of bee. Um, it was then brought to the United States because obviously our colony collapsed. Um, but anyway, so this, this one will show, some will show strong resistance to natural parasites. Um, they have a strong knack for foraging it's not a strain that tends to swarm a whole lot, but it makes them a little bit more difficult to find them in the United States because they're not actively around. Um, but because of this, when they do, there's a lot of inbreeding going on over time, which will decrease their resistance. But if you can tolerate an aggressive bee and you can monitor the colony, you know, it's an option for you. These, will, these bees last for a long time compared to others. The Russian bees. So we're gonna tell another fun story. I did a, well, I say I, Trey and I did a hive cutout last year. We cut a, we took a, we took a feral hive out of a granary. They were Russian bees. Some people will argue with me. I've already had the argument several times that Russian bees aren't aggressive. I beg to differ. We took them out of this granary and they were not happy. Um, I think it ended up with me getting about 75 stings. Trey got a, we don't even know how many Trey got, but ultimately we went to the ER that night <laughs> to get some shots, just to be on the safe side. Um, so I, going back to where I nicknamed my hives, they're not called my killer bee box. Since they've moved into the apiary, since they're now kind of doing their thing, they're very gentle. They're, they're, they're harmless now, but I'm telling you right now, they gave us a run for our money. That first day I was, I was done with them. But anyways, so they can be thought of to be a little bit more aggressive. They were, bought, they were brought to the United States in 1997 due to the colony collapse to parasites. So these bees have a little bit higher of a resilience towards the different parasites. Um, they, so when there was a study done, I think it was done by um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They took other types, other breeds of bees, took the Russian bees and they did an alcohol shake. And what they did, they found out that they had half, Russian bees had half what the other bees had when it came to mite count, which is, once you get into talking about mites, you'll understand why that's so important. Um, but pretty interesting study that I read. Um, the Russian bees also only tend to rear brood during times of nectar and pollen. So they're gonna stop that when that stops. Um, so they don't really require a lot of resources. Um, they have some unusual behaviors compared to others. So they're almost always going to have a queen cell ready to go. So they're almost ready to replace that queen at any given moment. Like she messes up one time, she's out the next one's in. They're ready for her. No matter what you do, 
Whereas other colonies you'll see in other types of bees, other bee breeds, they'll really only have a queen cell ready when they're ready to move on, um, to swarm, to replace, or whatever the case may be. <laughs> Another interesting trait is that there seems to be um, some aggression, but they're not really aggressive towards other bee breeds. So, yeah. so if you can understand this breed and would like to take it on, go for it. Again, they're a great breed to have, especially when it comes to the parasite options. Um, I know a lot of people are raising queen Russians now. Um, they're really, yeah, they're really not, they do produce a lot of honey. Um, so if you're wanting a good honey producer, but again, they can be aggressive. But then again, I guess anything can be aggressive when you're ripping their house apart, right? So. Does anyone have any questions about Russian bees? Yes. So again, going into hybrids, so he asked me about buying hybrid Russian bees and the difference. I could, could say that can talk all day long about all of the different hybrids that we have that, that are bees. I'm just kind of sticking with the main ones. Depends on what they're hybridized with, but depends on what they were made it with. Yeah. You've got Russian bees, you'll be fine. <laughs> Good. I'll tell you right now, they're also very, they're, they're one, in my opinion, and again, I'm no expert, but in my opinion, in my experience, um, you can tell when they're queen, right? And when they are not. Because we ended up taking two full boxes from this greenery. Um, one obviously had a queen, one obviously didn't have a queen, there's only one queen to have. And the queen, the one that did not have a queen, you opened that box and they were after you in a second. Um, they actually got moved the furthest away in my bee yard because of this. Um, but you couldn't even pull up without them because I was trying to get them to make their own queen. So I was trying to get them to do, ultimately it didn't work. We ended up combining the two together. But the one that did have the queen in there, I mean, you could open the box and they were, they were fine. Um, so it just depends on what, what they were mixed with, really. But there, a lot of people will use, they'll take certain genetics um, and will make those with others to kind of get that hybrid breed, depending on what they're trying to create. So a lot of them are gonna try to create that mite resistant bee. Um, yeah, but, oh, I hit the button, okay, sorry. So the German bee or the black European bee um, as you can tell, is extremely dark, but due to the cross-contamination, I'll say, of bees, they're really only identifying feature now is how dark their veins are in their wings. Um, they're not this dark any longer. But with that being said, <laughs> because of where they're from, they are able to survive long, cold winters better than any other breed um, that's out there. They are they are um, a little bit more defensive. So they do have brood diseases more often like American fowl brood, American and European fowl brood. Um, this bee's lost a lot of popularity over the world. It was one of the first bees brought to the United States and there's not a whole lot of them left. Um, some beekeepers will say that they're a little bit harder to work with. They make, um, so then they, have, they, they do have hybrids that we were mentioning earlier. Um, they have a defensive characteristic and they do have a reputation of seeing people and other things for really no reason. So they're not, they're not really popular here. And the Caucasian bee, this is the last one we're gonna talk about because this is deathly boring. Well, maybe not, I don't know. But, so this is a very popular breed in the United States but it has a very lack of honey production. So not huge honey producers. Um, so therefore they're more along the lines used for those that are in commercial pollination. So um, in our last, one of our last meetings, we had a beekeeper come in that he's actually a commercial beekeeper and has a thousand hives in California. Um, so this is, but it, they're strictly there for just pollination. He doesn't collect their honey. He doesn't want their honey. They're just strictly used for pollination purposes. Um, I didn't ask him what his breeds were, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably this one. Um, they're almost a silver gray color to dark brown. They um, were brought over in Europe and then crossbred with a Carnolian to kind of create this. They are very high propolis producers. Um, 
what the propolis I produce though is soft and sticky, which can make it a little bit harder for beekeepers than insects because they're gluing everything down. Um, <laughs> they do show some resilience to the European fowl brood, but are not overly inclined to swarm. And they do have that high propolis production that I already mentioned. They also tend to conserve their honey stores as well. So they're not typically eating all their wood they have. They do have a very gradual buildup rate so it's a little bit slower than other stocks we often use, um, but it does allow the honey to be stored more efficiently. So what they'll do is they'll actually store the honey around the brood um, and then won't move on to process the next comb until that one's completely finished. So they're a reasonable choice for new beekeepers. Um, but yeah. 